Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll share with you 10 of the biggest mistakes you can make while wearing black tie and how you can avoid them. <laughs> As one of the most formal dress codes you're likely to wear in your life, black tie has a surprising number of rules to help you look captivating and correct for the occasion. You can learn all you would ever want to know about these conventions from our comprehensive black tie guide on the Gentleman's Gazette website, or for a shorter alternative, you can download our free PDF guide. In today's video, though, we'll offer another approach to getting classic black tie exactly right by highlighting the things that most commonly go wrong. These 10 mistakes are not only some of the most common, but also the most aggravating, preventing men from achieving the lofty ideals of truly correct classic black tie. Think you might know already what we have in mind? Feel free to drop your predictions in the comments below. Without any further ado, let's jump in with our first mistake, which is wearing the wrong suit. By definition, a suit is any jacket and trouser combination, as well as the optional presence of a waistcoat, that are all cut from the same cloth. But types of suits, and the types of occasions for which they are appropriately worn, can vary drastically. And there's a sizable gulf in formality between a day suit and a dinner suit often called a tuxedo, or, depending on the language, some variation of smoking, though it isn't actually a smoking jacket. Now, we understand why this mistake is happening more and more all the time. As fewer men are wearing suits to begin with, the distinctions between types of suits becomes even more muddled. For a comprehensive breakdown of all of the ways in which a day suit and a dinner suit are different, you can consult this video, but we'll also give you a quick summary here. First, a tuxedo jacket should have peaked lapels or a shawl collar, usually with contrasting facings. Meanwhile, a day suit will typically have either peaked lapels or notched lapels that are not faced. In other words, they're just in the same fabric and finish as the rest of the suit. Tuxedo jackets should have buttons that are faced in either plain or grosgrain silk or black bone on some vintage models, while day suit buttons can be made from many different materials in various colors. Tuxedo jackets should have two jetted hip pockets, while day suits can feature a variety of pockets. Tuxedo jackets should have a single galon or braid, often made from silk, running down the outside of the trouser leg. Meanwhile, day suits don't have any such decoration. By the way, white tie trousers, which are even more formal, should have a double galon on each leg. White tie is also a suit, in this case a dress suit, but for more on white tie, you can consult our white tie guide. Tuxedo trousers should not have cuffs or turnups at the bottom, while day suits can, but don't have to. Dinner suits are typically made from black or black appearing wool or mohair, while day suits can come in any number of colors and materials. So, while we admit that the identifiers between a day suit and a dinner suit aren't quite as clear as night and day, we hope that these primary identifiers will help you to distinguish between them. Moving on, our second mistake for today is wearing the wrong watch. Just as certain suits are suited to certain occasions, indeed there is a time and place for every type of watch. That being said, it's perfectly acceptable, and in fact even more correct, to wear no watch at all with black tie, but if you really must wear a wristwatch, it's most correct for these evening occasions to wear formal evening dress watches. In other words, what you shouldn't wear here are sports watches. Now, we do understand that, at least at the present moment, sports watches are extremely popular. And indeed, if you've invested quite a bit of money in an expensive sports watch, it's only natural to want to show it off with your black tie ensembles. 
But the typical features of sports watches, like metallic body materials, chunky bracelets, and oversized, sometimes bulbous faces, are overall at odds with the sleek, minimalistic intent of true black tie. Therefore, rather than risking spoiling the lines of your dinner suit ensemble, you're better off wearing a true dress watch or no watch at all. You can let Nathan explain to you which watch is right for every occasion, and trust us, you can set your watch to his sage advice. And yes, we also know that everyone's favorite MI6 agent has also more recently taken to wearing sports watches with his black tie ensembles. But this is primarily for reasons of product placement and also because of the necessities of the plot. After all, a built-in laser is a much better complication for a sports watch than a dress watch. Next up is our number three mistake, wearing the wrong shoes. When wearing black tie, you always want to put your best foot forward, and this is achieved most easily by wearing the correct footwear. Traditionally, a formal evening shoe called an opera pump was the sartorial standard for both black tie and white tie. And while it's mostly consigned to white tie these days, it still certainly can be worn with black tie, as I'm doing here today. These days, though, you're most commonly going to see a plain-toed black Oxford with black tie ensembles. And whether an Oxford or an opera pump, patent leather is the correct material choice. In the case of Oxfords, they can be styled more traditionally with multiple leather panels, just without a toe cap, or they can also be styled in a hole cut appearance. Recently, velvet slippers have become very popular as black tie footwear, but know that these, because they are more casual, are more appropriate for alternative black tie looks or the black tie optional dress code. Now, we understand that quality shoes can be expensive, so if you'd rather not shell out the cash for the formal shoe styles we mentioned above, you can substitute the most formal of business shoes. These would be very well-shined, non-brogued, cap-toe or hole-cut Oxfords in calfskin or cordovan leather, and yes, they must be black. And whether you're wearing these business shoes or the patent leather Oxfords we mentioned, be sure to complete your look with a pair of evening shoelaces in a finish that match your bow tie, cummerbund, and lapel facings, as well as formal evening socks in black silk. We offer both of these options in the Fort Belvedere shop. Number four on our list today is wearing the wrong shirt. Based on our previous points, you can probably guess our next mistake, confusing a day shirt for an evening shirt. The modern shirt for black tie is a white shirt, formal in style, that evolved from the even more formal shirt styles that are needed for white tie. These white tie shirts feature detachable wing collars, as well as shirt bibs and cuffs that are made from Marcella Piquet. During the early 20th century, the black tie shirt replaced that stiff Marcella bib with a pleated shirt front, but it still took studs instead of having conventional buttons. And while early black tie shirts could still feature detachable wing collars, today you're most likely to see attached, turn-down collar styles. Note, though, that many contemporary black tie shirts you're going to see on sale today will feature unusual details that are at odds with the more sedate character of classic black tie. These will include things like creative pleats, graphic decorations, and those supposedly handy but really just clunky convertible barrel cuffs, all of which really have no place on a classic black tie shirt. And while both white tie and black tie shirts take cufflinks, white tie shirts have single cuffs, whereas black tie shirts have double cuffs, also called French cuffs. At the halfway point on our list today is our number five mistake, wearing the wrong tie. 
Just in case you weren't already aware, the tie in black tie refers explicitly to a black bow tie. In other words, it just isn't proper to substitute a conventional long necktie instead, even if that tie happens to be black. A black bow tie shows off your evening shirt, displaying the white expanse of the shirt to help contrast against the black of the rest of your ensemble, and it also clearly displays your shirt studs. Meanwhile, a conventional necktie would obviously cover up a lot of this detail. Black neckties also lack the myriad of stylistic options that are available to you with black bow ties. Contrary to what's often shown in modern depictions, classic black bow ties were available in a variety of both styles and materials to suit different face shapes. So, when preparing your black tie ensemble, you should relish the opportunity to sift through the many bow tie options available to you, from bat wings to butterflies, and satins to grow grains, and even single ended models. And of course, we offer a wide variety in the Fort Belvedere shop as well. Whatever you choose, though, do make sure that you're actually tying your black bow tie yourself and not going with a pre tied model. If you need some guidance, you can consult our how-to guide here. Next up is our number six mistake, renting a black tie ensemble. If you don't regularly attend black tie events, it could seem wasteful to spend money on a classic black tie ensemble, and it might be tempting to rent instead. But the fact of the matter is, if you attend even one black tie event a year, and really we'd be tempted to say even one black tie event every few years, it will ultimately make more sense for you to buy your own ensemble. Of course, with every black tie event you attend, the rental fees are going to build up over time, and they will eventually exceed the cost of just buying an ensemble yourself. And even if owning a black tie ensemble didn't make better economical sense, it would certainly still make better stylistic sense. We've already produced an entire video about the dangers and pitfalls of renting a tuxedo, but we feel that this one image speaks for itself. Rental tuxedos are invariably poorly fitted, usually made from low quality materials, and regularly poorly styled as well. They're typically either going to be too broad to accommodate men of variable girth, or too skinny to satisfy modern fashion trends. So you're better off acquiring your own ensemble fitted to your own person. And if money is tight, you can take advantage of secondhand shopping using our tips to help you find the perfect ensembles. And as a bonus, the heavier fabrics used in vintage evening wear are going to drape better than almost any modern fabric will, flattering your form even more. And to make the outfit go even further and improve cost per wear, you can experiment with separating the jacket from the trousers and wearing them individually in different dress codes like creative black tie, black tie optional, or warm weather black tie, but more on that last one later. Number seven on our list today is focusing only on the black in black tie. We said earlier that the black bow tie is central to the black tie dress code, but don't think that this means that the color should dominate your entire ensemble. Ever since the 1990s and exploding in popularity in the 2010s, there has been an increasing interest in monochromatic black tie looks, usually championed by celebrities. Presumably these outfits are intended to look sleek and cool, but at least in our opinion, they come off more just looking trendy and boring, neither of which are very classic. We go into more detail about why black is massively overrated in menswear here, but this is especially true for evening wear, where the black of the jacket and trousers are specifically meant to contrast against the white of the shirt, as well as things like the waistcoat or pocket square, and other hints of color like a red boutonniere or gold cufflinks. 
Meanwhile, wearing all black ruins this unique effect and transforms the rarefied quality of black tie into something more befitting an Undertaker or perhaps John Wick. But now, yeah, I'm thinking I'm back. Our number eight mistake today is mixing up Midnight Blue. To better introduce our next concept, I think I should hand things over to Professor Preston. Preston, he's Preston, he's Professor Preston. Light from modern bulbs of a certain lumen factor can be absorbed by genuine black garments in such a way as to give them a sludgy gray or green cast. In the 20th century, this problem was solved by the adoption of midnight blue. This was an extremely dark shade of blue that very closely resembled black, but reflected just enough artificial light as to avoid any unpleasant optical illusions. Indeed, it was said at the time to be almost blacker than black. All right, with that scientific explanation out of the way, let's go back to didn't get a doctorate, Preston. You know, I prefer to be called regular Preston, Besides, he's not even a real professor. Anyway, Midnight Blue has remained a popular choice for formal menswear ever since its introduction, and because it so closely resembles black, it's still a stylish alternative for your black tie ensembles. Less elegant, however, is the slow creep of lighter and lighter shades into modern black tie looks, such as you're seeing here. This is clearly high noon blue, not midnight blue. In other words, if it's obvious that your midnight blue isn't black, then you're probably not wearing midnight blue. Whom might we be able to blame for the popularization of this trend? Well, again, we think it's none other than Bond. James Bond. Just compare how light this midnight blue tuxedo from Skyfall is compared to a genuine midnight blue from Dr. No. Ultimately, of course, you have free reign to select a dinner jacket in whatever color you so desire. But if you want to cultivate a classic look, save the lighter shades for when you're under a sunny blue sky and wear true midnight blue at those evening soirees. Our penultimate mistake for today is number nine, disregarding the details. In addition to the broad strokes like jackets and trousers, a proper black tie ensemble also features several small details that take the outfit from acceptable to exceptional. In addition to the aforementioned evening socks and shoelaces, there are also other essential pieces like cufflinks and studs that will provide a metallic luster to your outfit, as well as doing the necessary work of keeping your shirt front and cuffs closed. Other details might not serve as vital a practical purpose, but they're no less essential if you want to look good. If you're going to expose your waist at any point in the evening, it needs to have a proper waist covering, either a cummerbund or an evening waistcoat. And we do mean an evening waistcoat, not just a black day waistcoat with its considerably higher button stance. And of course, never wear a cummerbund and an evening waistcoat at the same time. Meanwhile, if you're wearing a double-breasted jacket, you can actually skip the waist coverings entirely, provided you keep your jacket closed at all times, which, by the way, you should. Speaking of keeping your jacket buttoned, if you remove your jacket because you're hot or stuffy, you're going to expose several of the underpinnings of your outfit, like stays, clasps, belts, or suspenders, which are going to ruin the clean lines and really the magic of your look. Of course, we understand that in many locations it can get very hot, even for black tie gatherings. But to preserve the elegance of black tie in these conditions, consider wearing warm weather black tie alternatives like light colored dinner jackets in tropical weight wools to feel cool while also looking your coolest. 
And speaking of these substitutions, while black tie is fairly standardized as a dress code, do try to take the opportunity to individualize or provide a bit more character to your outfit where you can. You can inject a bit of personality with things like a colorful boutonniere or a creative pocket square fold. You could also try formal outerwear on for size, like a satin silk evening scarf and a Homburg hat in cooler weather, or a straw boater in warmer weather. Just make sure that when considering these finer details, you don't miss any of the basics, like removing the tack stitching from your jacket. Trust us, that's not supposed to be there after you buy it. Finally today then, we come to our 10th mistake, wearing loud black tie instead of proud black tie. A major component of contemporary fashion is attempting to stand out from the crowd by being the flashiest or glitziest. And of course, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's something you genuinely enjoy, then we say shine on, you shooting star. Uh, I guess you can call me Glam Preston? Man, this corner of the Gentleman's Gazette multiverse is weird. That's better. Anyway, as you might imagine, this exuberant approach doesn't really gel fully with the classic style, so it's not something that we here at the Gentleman's Gazette are going to regularly pursue. In our opinion, flamboyant additions like bold colors, feathers, sequins, or jacquard distract from the fundamental principles of classic black tie. Which is to say, a time-tested, sedate ensemble that encourages subtle personalization within a refined framework. One of the original goals of the uniformity of both black tie and white tie is that gentlemen wouldn't have to worry about what they or the other men present were wearing. Classic black tie ensures that you're never going to be overwhelmed by your clothes, leaving you instead to be overwhelmed by the evening. So then, if forewarned is forearmed, you've now got access to an arsenal of information sure to defeat those pesky black tie mistakes that can ruin a classic ensemble. And of course, we hope that being aware of these mistakes will encourage you to wear black tie more often, because the worst mistake when it comes to black tie is not wearing it at all. By the way, are there any other mistakes you think we missed today? If so, be sure to leave them in the comments below. In today's video, I am of course wearing a classic black tie ensemble that I believe exemplifies many of the standards we discussed today. This is a vintage ensemble dating from the late 1930s and made in a heavyweight black wool. The jacket is single-breasted and ventless with two jetted pockets at the hips, and it has peaked lapels finished in grosgrain silk. And rather than being faced in fabric, the button on the front as well as the sleeve buttons are carved in a grosgrain-like pattern. The matching trousers are of course also in black, and they feature a single galon down the side in grosgrain. The trousers are held up by a pair of suspenders, also vintage, black, silk, and grosgrain. My white shirt has a turn-down collar, a traditional pleated front, and French cuffs. I've got inserted into it a matching set of cufflinks and studs, featuring gold as the metal and onyx as the insert. My pocket square is also vintage in plain white linen, and I've got it configured in a crown fold for a bit of personality. And one more vintage piece, as mentioned before, are my patent leather opera pumps from Allen Edmonds. Their bows, by the way, are also in grosgrain silk. Rounding out the outfit today are my accessories from Fort Belvedere. These would include our black silk evening socks, a prototype boutonniere design, which is a red carnation, and my cummerbund and bow tie, which are also in grosgrain silk. The bow tie, by the way, is one of my favorites. It's a single-ended model that provides a crisp and elegant look. 
While this tuxedo did come with its own evening waistcoat, I've chosen to wear it with a cummerbund today, as the jacket does need a bit of tailoring to fit my body better, and I feel that currently it fits my frame best when I've got it buttoned. Therefore, a cummerbund seemed like the natural choice. And while my boutonniere is a prototype, we offer similar models of red carnations in various sizes in the Fort Belvedere shop, as well as all of the other Fort Belvedere accessories I'm wearing today, and a host of other black tie and white tie accoutrements. <laughs>